I suppose we're all looking for a, a whole true story that makes sense. But I think what makes you believe in things is not what's there, it's about what's not there. With any story, the gaps between things is where you locate your belief. You know, it's unbelievable to start with, but that makes you believe it. The expedition began in 2010. We assembled a group of consultants, ecological experts to advise on avoiding damage to the site, and representative from the host country to safeguard their interests and oversee what happened to anything we found. We had spent the summer of 2009 uh, remotely mapping the site from the surface. It was clear from our scans that there was something down there, but there was no clear indication as to what it was. I've been doing this job for nearly 30 years and I wasn't about to jump to any conclusions. Right, we're all here. Coffee? Yes? Very good. Right, welcome everybody. My name's Andrew and I'm the project director on this expedition. Uh, this gentleman here is Piotr Klimek. He's a, a maritime archaeologist of extraordinary dive experience. He will be leading the team under the water alongside Bruce, who's going to be in charge of the divers. So, we're going to start by ground-truthing the main anomalies from the geophysics. And as you can see, we have, we have many artefacts spread over a, a large area with the major groups here, here and here. No sign of a ship. Uh, which might indicate the wreck is early and the hull totally disintegrated. But do keep an eye out for any hull structure that we might have missed. Don't forget to uh, record your locations as you work and keep in communication with the surface team. This phase of the expedition is what we call a pre-disturbance survey. And this is mostly to establish really um, in detail what is and how much of it is down there. Yeah, go ahead, Piotr, over. Hello, mate. Just a quick update. We're working our way to cover the dive site. I wish we could see this. Over. It began for me in 2008. I was in the middle of my doctoral thesis. I say in the middle, I hadn't really written anything in a couple of months and I was, I was running out of funds. And then I discovered the clip on the internet. I assumed it was posted by um, a backpacker or a holiday maker, someone like that. 
Well, you could see a beach, I assumed East African, and a community of fishermen. And the clip was entitled, Fishermen Discover Statue. The group of fishermen have pulled something up in the net. It looked like a curled up fetal monkey. To see something come out of the water that you can't quite explain, that's an adventure. You want to know more. I thought, if these fishermen found one thing, it stands to reason that there is more down there. So I wanted to find this beach and I wanted to talk to these fishermen. Yeah, this is the beach. I knew as soon as I saw it, because I've seen it so often on the video. The fishermen said they had been back to look whether there was anything else out there and they couldn't find anything. So after a, a lot of negotiation, they took us out to where they said they discovered it. You think we have the right spot? First day we go to this island. Is this this place? I go in, I dive. I dive for hours to end. Do you find anything? No. So that was nothing again? No. It took us days because it was a blind search. Nothing? Here. Shit. Patience, yes? Yeah. Okay. We nearly gave up. It was on the fifth day. Had my GoPro on, went down, half an hour search. And voila. Finally. Yes? You sure? Yes. You saw something? Yeah? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Peter sent me the footage. It showed what looked like a, a classical sculpture that had lain on the seabed for a considerable amount of time. We knew that it was worth pursuing, but uh, it was going to be hard to get funding through the usual channels. Last year, he caused controversy in the modern art world by creating a diamond-encrusted skull. Une révolution dans le monde de l'art. Brash and brazen artist Damien Hirst is putting more than 200 new pieces up for auction. Lot number one, 8 and 200,000. Any more? 8 and 300,000. Thank you. Hearst's open mouth shark staggered all expectations. So to you, Bruno, a million five. Now that's a pretty penny for a pretty pickle. One of the people that we approached was an artist who had just been in the news. I didn't know much about him. To me, he was the, the shark guy. I'd had the auction where I sold all my works in you know, this three-day big sale. And it really was the point where all the work like became commodity and it was like, you know, it just seemed like you make something, sell it, make something, sell it, make something, sell it. It, seems, it seemed unsustainable and unfulfilling. Nine million pounds and nine million pounds. Last chance at nine million pounds. So, congratulations. For some reason after that auction, it seemed like something had ended and something new was beginning. It's a new era in his exploration of inner space. I love fantasy shipwreck stories when I was a kid. You know, I just love them. Within the violent waters that cover this earth comes this story of suspense, chills, terror, excitement beyond compare. All those old movies about treasures found under the sea. Somewhere in these waters is a treasure worth a fortune in gold. 
I mean, I love the sea because it's an element that's alien to us. It's like, you know, it's like another planet on our own planet. For well, the ocean is the last of the Earth's great unexplored frontiers. To find a major sponsor so soon, who had money and an interest, that was amazing. He was basically prepared to take a gamble. I think everything that I've ever done has been a gamble. But I definitely wasn't tempted to get a wetsuit on because um, I think the sharks would eat me. Yeah, this is service support. Go ahead. I have just located the position. Give me five minutes. From the scans, we knew there was a lot down there, but what we discovered uh, was much bigger and more baffling than, than we'd expected. What's amazing is how it's integrated into the reef. And to actually see the corals and everything that's growing onto it and the fish that are attached to it, but it's still a sculpture. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. To actually find something that's not been seen for, you know, lifetimes. It's almost like, you know, finding something in its natural habitat. That's what's exciting about the whole project. Nature is sort of claiming it, but it hasn't claimed all of it yet. So it's, it's like there's, there's the beauty of the nature and there's the beauty of the sculpture side by side. It's in a sort of extraordinary garden. It's like a sort of strange Victorian grotto of the underworld. It takes lots of years for corals to develop. And you start asking yourself, for how long have these things been down here? You've just got so many questions coming through your mind of how did they get there? How were they made? Who was it that possibly made them? And what size ships transporting them? Why were they coming through this area? It's, it opens so many questions. It's a huge piece, it's just scattered over quite a wide area, buried at different angles in the sand. It's no sense really of what happened. There's no sense of, of accident. Is it, is it a shipwreck? Is it, is it several shipwrecks? It's a mystery. At this stage, it's a mystery.
Well, these are what we found in the first couple of weeks. We have a fascinating range of artifacts developing. A wide range of dates, provenances. The selection of different styles suggests this could be the contents of a merchant ship. As yet, we don't have anything to pin a specific date down. Today, we will start working with the airlift. It's basically a device that will vacuum the seabed, takes away the lighter materials and the sand, silt. You know, for the first time in possibly centuries, you know, we're, we're disturbing what's underneath the sand. Uh, there could be much more down there. I just saw something glinting in the sand. As you work, in the least expected moments, you uncover something that is crucial. Guys, look at this. All right? Okay. What is it? It's Roman. Wow. It is Roman. Look at this. Fantastic. That's Nero. AD 54 to 68, Roman first century. Looks like you got yourself a date. You got ourselves a date. Big moment, big moment for us. The picture starts to become much clearer now. This is great. Exactly the kind of thing we'd hope to find. The coin dates from the rule of the Emperor Nero. So we know for certain the ship could not have gone down before 54 AD. And I'm trying to get the important bit up here. Where is it? There it is. It's perfect. And you see him, Nero. So, if we're talking about a shipwreck from between the mid-first and mid-second centuries AD, during this period, there was a Roman market in plunder of earlier classical cities and a market for artifacts from Egypt. And of course, in the first century navigational guide, the Periplus of the Erythraean Sea, there were records of routes of trade between the Mediterranean world and China in the east. Uh, this document, the Periplus, was key to us. It's proof of trade and cultural cross-pollination across the first and second centuries. Proof that a merchant could amass such a, an eclectic collection. But there were no um, rich cultural centers nearby where there was any kind of trade in antiques. What was Chicago, as big and valuable as this, doing off this stretch of the East African coast? We knew the ship was from the first or second century. And although the ship's woodwork would have disintegrated, we began to uncover what seemed like the personal effects of a ship's crew. 
This is a whole series of plates, bowls. There's quite a lot of diversity here of shapes and forms. Look at that, that looks like a sailor's plate to me. That's a load of coins all accreted together. There's some loose ones here as well. But that would have been probably in a sack. And the whole sack went down and the whole thing's fused together. Nice, isn't it? Hello, guys. And then we found something else. Where is Angel? The barge. It was a, a huge surprise. A huge clue. My God. So. Uh, this is a bolt that would have been used in the keel of a ship in the first or second century AD. And uh, this is truly enormous for something of this kind. I've only ever seen a few examples uh, from this era, but uh, the biggest I've seen have been from uh, a Roman wreck from the French coast at La Madrague de Giam. Uh, and that ship was big. But this is much bigger, and it's, uh, it's broken at the end, you know, it's, it's sheared off. So who knows what the actual size would have been. This one bolt meant that we could, uh, with the help of our colleagues from Southampton University, spend the whole winter recreating how the boat might have been built and, and what it might have looked like. One of the biggest vessels that we have to compare it to is from south of France, Madre de Gien. Mm -hmm. And this is a cross section through the bottom of that vessel. That's the bolt. Huh? That's the bolt running right the way <clears> down <throat> there. And the one from your site is way, way bigger. So it's got to be coming off a much, much bigger ship. So we went through to some of the really standard iconography yeah. um, from the ancient world that gives us this idea of the, the recurved bows. That's consistent with the Madrag, and it's what they seem to be using on these really, really big merchant ships. What we got to with doing that was this. So what are we talking lengthwise, do you think? 60 metres. 60 metres. 60 metres seems like a... 50% bigger. So, yeah. <clears throat> so really, really big. And we know vessels that big could have existed. Mm. You know, it's not outside the realms of the engineering capabilities that they had. You know, quite a lot of crew on this boat. A lot of mm -hmm. big, heavy mast sails. I thought we'd go a little bit further and start to look at the actual vessel sailing along. So we've just taken our basic reconstruction and we've given it the sort of CGI um, treatment, if the you like. Treatment. Yeah. And there it is sailing along. And you get a real idea of the scale of the, the thing. It's even at the, yeah, the guy just out on the, yeah, yeah, the flying the gallery car. at the front. Quite simply, we were looking at an enormous ship. We knew the ship was from, well, probably from the first or, or second century. And so we knew that we were looking at, by far, uh, the largest ship uh, from that period to ever have been identified. I was looking uh, for records of an extraordinarily large ship. Even though import and export duties would have been levied and recorded, very little survives. Shipping records for the East African coast during um, the first and second centuries after Christ are virtually non-existent. There was nothing that helped me identify it. So I started looking into eyewitness accounts that would have recorded a monumental ship The great Roman chroniclers like Tacitus or Pliny the Elder mentioned nothing. Neither did the more obscure diarists. 
So I moved on to Tales of Legend. And that's how I discovered the story of Aulus Kilidius Amutan. As the legend goes, Amutan was a man freed from slavery. And he developed this love of beautiful things and amassed this huge collection of treasures. He planned to build a monumental palace or a temple to house them all. And he built the Apistos, the largest ship known to man, to transport them all. On this great voyage to the temple, the ship was struck by a storm or attacked by a giant sea monster, depending on what version of the story you read, and lost forever. In the first century AD, one of the really popular genres of literature was collections of marvels, collections of, of interesting things that were said to have happened. But how many of these texts tell the truth and the absolute truth is, is, is a very big question. I would say it's naive to take the story entirely at face value, but I wouldn't say it's naive to think that there is a kernel of truth in it somewhere. But how many pieces of art he had, what it was that he had, how far he sailed, why he sailed out, and all of that is the stuff that will have been legendized in the telling. Now to the Mediterranean. Legend tells of an eccentric collector's enormous ship and his worldly possessions lost at sea. Captain George Knowles has made it his life's work to find the treasure. I think it's a very human thing to romanticize the story of Hamilton. I suppose your common sense would tell you this is just made up, this is just a story, but then if you actually find proof of it, it becomes that much more remarkable because it's actually true. Well, one or two of the more uh, credulous treasure hunters of the 20th century took this obscure legend seriously. Uh, you know, I come from a background where we must have proof and we, we, we must have evidence. Ours is a hunt for knowledge and, and not treasure. Any firm details about where the wreck may lie have been lost in the sands of time. I started to believe that the wreck had not been found, not because it was a myth, but because people were looking in the wrong place. Captain Knowles swears he will leave no stone unturned until he has found the lost treasure. Peter's romanticism, I think, uh, sometimes got the better of him. Yep, we're back this year for uh, another six weeks, this is as long as we can die for, with, before the weather changes. And the plan is to look at some of the bigger pieces and uh, hopefully bring them up. Peter, Peter, the diver is standing by for the crane, over. 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 Over.
looking at is the skull of an elephant or great mammoth. It looks like it's man-made, carved out of marble. When the Greeks and Romans discovered fossil remains, they informed their popular beliefs. And it used to be thought with skulls like this, with the large single cavity in the center of the face, that these gave birth to or at least justification to the existence of Cyclops and mythological tales. I think it's an incredibly detailed example of the power of, of mythology. One thing that excited me about the project is the, how you inhabit the past, and it's like it's unknowable, really but little glimpses and fragments of objects and stories, that's what makes you kind of know the past. All right, Diver Bruce, Diver Bruce, support, over. Let me know when you're ready for lifting, over. History's always been rewritten and rewritten. You know, the solidity that we call history is written from fragments. Amazing, look at him, that raised spine. Wow, look, you can see how he's oxidized under there. He's been there for some time, it looks like. Human features with bestial traits characteristic of the Mesopotamian demon. The question is, could this be the so-called Pazuzu demon? In the 1920s, British archaeologists were digging in the upper Tigris Valley of Mesopotamia. They discovered a small settlement along the banks of the river. And among their finds was thought by some to be a head of the Babylonian demon king, Pazuzu. Stylistically, they both seem to be of a piece. I remember when I first saw the demon, I was asking myself, why am I believing it? Am I believing it because it's got these missing parts? You believe it because it's, you know, in a history of it traveling through time, through thousands of years, it's bound to have, you know, had accidents and mishaps. And I love the way that time can age it and deteriorate it. It's like the action of the world on this object. You realize that everything in the world is going to become fragments. And then you realize that that's really where belief lies, is between fragments. We thought he was, you know, lost forever, and this could be him. And he's beautiful. What makes you believe in things is not what's there, it's about what's not there. A 
as Cyclops, demons, unicorns. It did tell us a little bit about Amotan's character. I think he genuinely believed in monsters, he believed in cyclopses, he believed in unicorns, you know, I and mean, I just think he was that type of a person. And I guess if you believe in them in the beginning, then you, you know, you just, you know, you create things to justify their existence. Whether it was this Amatan that Peter's talking about, or whether it's somebody else, these are not um, objects that are just randomly chosen. I'm not prepared to say it is Amatan, but for my money, there's certainly somebody with a vision and with a dream, a massive dream, and a pretty big ego behind all of this. I can't see this as a trading vessel. There are very definite aesthetic choices being made here. I think if it was trade stuff, you'd see multiples of similar things. This seems to be more coordinated. Obviously, Amerton had an idea of an audience, and then his dreams were scuppered when the boat sank. But now these objects have come back up again. I wanted to find a great place to exhibit them. The Venetians amassed collections and brought things from far reaches of the world. You know, when you look at the four horses in St. Mark's, and you realize that they're a massive symbol of Venice. And so is the lion. But they came from faraway lands. They weren't really a symbol of Venice, they were plundered. The lion came from Athens and the four horses came from Constantinople. The history of where they came from is lost and they become totally synonymous with Venice. drifted in a strong current over quite a wide area, over sea grasses, over big lumps of coral. And then we found scattered, half-buried gold objects. So on one hand, I was thinking, my God, this is, this is possibly the greatest moment of my career. But on the other hand, panic set in. Because this stuff is worth millions. Ja, 
I mean, to find this much gold uh, is thrilling, but for an archaeologist, it's, it's a big problem. Your gut instinct is to, to bring up something valuable, but we can't do that. My solution is simple. I mean, you bring this stuff up as soon as you can. Treasure. Treasure. Ha, 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 ha. This, this expedition is not about treasure. Okay. No, no, I'm just saying bring it up now, that way it's safe, we know where it is. You're missing the point, you're missing the point. The more time goes by, the more people will know. We want to be able to study why it's sitting there, where it's sitting how the marine life is growing around it. This is, this is how you... Yeah, no, you work on the I, I get that, I get that, but what, what, what time frame are you looking at? Let, let, let's say seven days minimum. We increase the, the security quietly. I just think you're naive in thinking that we're keeping this quiet for seven days. Peter, you need to trust our judgment on this, okay? Now, I know we're all really excited, but, you know, this goes without saying, those confidentiality agreements that you signed, they're serious, okay? No photos, absolutely nothing posted on the internet, or any bloody tweets or anything like that. The chances are that once the truth is out, it will just generate uh, all sorts of interest, you know, from treasure hunters, from, from pirates, from uh, all sorts. Really what I want to be able to do is to just double the security for the, you know, the remaining week. There we have a ship, but I don't know what is going on. But uh, the people, they go there, they, they come back, you know. We see a lot of villagers here, they saw that maybe they search for something like a, maybe gasoline, petrol. They make research for fish, maybe. Some friends, they told me that they see big like a sculpture, like a woman. They sit down on the sea there. What I'd like to do is just give a briefing on what we want to achieve this morning. Ready? Uh, we're going to load the pucker up first, and we're going to put all the lift bags, all the ropes, and the gear for most of the divers onto the packet and we're going to send it out. Okay, any questions on that? So today's big day. We've decided after much deliberation to bring the gold items up. Okay, over and out. about it but do you honestly believe that it will probably not mm. 
going straight into the water. Yep. I mean, the amazing thing about the gold works that were found is that gold doesn't tarnish, so they're totally timeless. It's shiny and it sort of dances in your eyes. You see it in movies. The guy opens the case and this gold shines on their faces. There are so many objects made of gold. I mean, this collector, he was obviously obsessed with it as a material. Gold makes people do crazy things, you know, it's like it has done for years, you know, there's a lot of blood associated with gold. You know, gold can drive people mad. I mean, who's to say what makes it like that? Is it its rarity, its scarcity, or is it, you know, is it something, you know, naturally inside the metal itself? Unbelievable. Got it? <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's interesting that the gold was found on its own. I think that indicates to me that maybe it, uh, they tried to escape with the gold. You know, the ship was definitely going down. It was irreparably damaged. And they thought the gold was worth the risk of putting in a smaller boat and trying to escape with. If you rely on myth, if you rely on legend, people tend to not take you very seriously. But this vast amount of gold suddenly made my story come to life. At this point, I was prepared to go out on a limb by saying that what we had found was indeed Amotan's treasure. Today, one of the divers uncovered a, a huge golden disc. 
And uh, it was found in an area where we found many of the other gold items. But it was completely covered with silt. And uh, obviously there's pressure now to bring it up as soon as possible. That's a very good move. We'll, we'll postpone until tomorrow. Hopefully, the weather. We left a minimal crew on the boat for now, just to keep it safe. And uh, we're waiting for the weather to clear. It's not looking like it's clearing, is it? It's important that we lift the gold disc as soon as possible. To me, it's the clearest indication yet that we have found Amatan's treasures. In later versions of the Amotan myth, the hero gets visited by the goddess Artemis, who instructs him to build a temple to the sun god Apollo and that becomes his motivation to collect the great treasures of the old world. This story was told after Christianity took hold and can be read as a warning against embracing the old pagan gods, with Amatan punished for worshipping false idols, gods going back to the earliest civilizations. It must have been a night like this that it all ended for Amotan. Imagine the Apistos loaded with Amotan's collection coming up against a storm like this. is back. The sun god Apollo is with us. I believe what we're lifting today isn't just a gold disc. It's evidence of solar worship, an image of the sun, a sun disc. Sun disk has been used by many civilizations and cultures to venerate the god of the sun by literally reflecting its rays. The Egyptians and Incas used them, the, the Japanese and the Celts. The ancient Egyptians believed the sun's daily pattern of regeneration suggested their own rising after death. This was um, symbolic of the sun's power to give life, to take away. I think that this sun this is the centerpiece for Amatan's temple to the sun god Apollo. And the other items that we found, they were to fill the temple.
Uh, welcome, everyone. The good news is, with just a few more things to bring up tomorrow, we have retrieved 82 items. Uh, the bad news is, it seems there's nothing else down there, so our work here's over. Well, what about the drop-off? Uh, yes, we have uh, a drop-off here. Uh, the depth drops down to uh, 60 to 100 metres. So, legend has it that there were 100 objects in the boat. Because we've got um, 15 or so missing, um, perhaps we should look there? You know, the side scan didn't pick anything up. Well, perhaps we didn't scan further enough into the drop-off. I mean. Yeah, I mean, we know that ship is driven from the deep water onto the reef because of the way that the cargo spilled out. I'm really happy. I mean, Peter, you should be very happy. I am, it just feels like the end is missing. <laughs> to go home now, knowing that there is an area that I haven't looked at, it's just, it doesn't sit right. We've got two more days. Yes, we've got two more days, but, um, you know, we've got an awful lot to do. I don't really want to start investigating another area. Um, you know, well, it's not we... another area, it's the drop-off, we know where it is. Okay. Peter would like us to uh, explore further into the drop-off, which we have scanned. Um, we didn't find anything. If we're not coming back, shouldn't we make sure that we've checked everywhere? We're just going to have one last look in the deep drop-off. I know that this is a long shot, you know. The first thing that came to me was the title, Treasures from the Wreck of the Unbelievable. I started thinking of it as a sort of statement, so it's like Treasures from the Wreck of the Unbelievable, like it's kind of something inside your mind, like the unbelievable is a place in your mind. You know, years ago when I was a student, I was living in a squat in White Hart Lane with some mates. In my bedroom, I could hear a guy who lived next door and I could hear him through the wall. And then I stopped hearing him. I mean, we thought maybe something had happened. And then after I didn't hear him for about a week, I got my friends and I said, look, come on, let's go and have a look. 
So we kicked both doors down and then went in there. We actually went in, first of all, because we thought maybe he died. It was like the whole room was just filled with stuff, and there was nobody in there. I found out later he was called Mr. Barnes, but at the time I didn't know what he was called. He was one of those guys that went round like, with a shopping trolley and bags, and he'd collect things, he didn't bring them back, so he was like a hoarder. The rooms were piled high with stuff, and I went to the top of these piles, and I excavated through the piles, and I found, like, every toothpaste tube he'd ever used, money wrapped up in bags, you know, lots of magazines from, like, the 40s and the 20s. It was, like, a whole bag of 50p's and then a bag of 2p's. He had a collection of, like, clocks. He sort of converted them, painted them, mended them. It was, like, 60 years of existence in one space. I don't know, there's something about this man that I got to know. Going through the time, there were like layers of, you know, geography going through them. But when we got to the table, I found a normal man. And he'd just put objects on a table and put objects on a table until he'd kind of lost his mind or lost touch with civilization. And then created this huge collection. I mean, in a way, it becomes an infatuation when you discover something like this. And you try and get inside the mind of somebody who no longer exists. You start to go on this journey, and then you kind of get lost in it. With any story, I think you get interested in, you know, the characters. You know, I'm a collector and I'm an artist. I understand all those things about money and collecting and, you know, the, you know, the kind of uh, addiction of it. Looking at Amatan through his collection and through his objects, he was a collector like today's collectors are. I think that he begged and borrowed and commissioned and stole to amass this collection. Welcome everybody. We're going to be diving a little bit deeper this year. We're going to be diving down to 60 metres, so uh, all the usual procedures will apply. And we have a new diver this year. His name's Peter. We are going to uh, do this as an assisted dive. OK, let's hit that drop off. Diving to this depth for the first time is strange enough. These figures, like they've always been there. And because you can float around them at any height, you sort of forget how big they actually are. You know, I like the fact that Amatan was kind of nuts on the scale of what he tried to do. He seems kind of arrogant in lots of ways, and then he seems foolish in lots of other ways. 
but above it all, he seems driven to amass this collection. So we've identified three, perhaps four, uh, sculptures in the deep water. Because of their depth and because of the size, we, we really want to bring them up as soon as we can. You know, this piece we estimate to, to weigh up to upwards of 30 tonnes. We've already had a few divers down to have a scout to see, you know, how we might lift it. Idea is to have that as your main lifting point. Yeah. Then you have secondary lifting points to there. been a huge amount of planning in this because we don't even know how fragile it is. I mean, just the scale of it and the fact that it survived this long potentially uh, means it must be a very fine casting. Everything in place? I hope so. A bit worried, a bit nervous. Well, the worst case scenario is that we've underestimated the weight of us and uh, it pulls the crane over. as the crane takes over from the, the lift bags. The crane's doing more work than the lift bags now. I feel the barge listing slightly. Do I think the enormous ship of legend existed, it's completely impossible to say whether this ship that ended up here was, was the Apostos. Um, it, it, it certainly chimes with the legend, um, and it would have been similar in scale to the legend, uh, but we'll never know. I know that not all the pieces of the puzzle are here. I'm, I'm very aware of that. But I think we have enough pieces of the puzzle to support a story. When you think about the whole story, it's unbelievable to start with. But most things from history do seem very hard to believe. You know, you look at the Venus de Milo, and look at the way the arms are cut off on it, and you think somebody must have done that on purpose.
For me, the whole exhibition was about belief. Belief in the past. Belief in God. Belief in gods. Or not believing. Belief is a strange thing because there's no absolute truth. Artists don't have the answers, and science doesn't have the answers, and religion doesn't have the answers. But somehow, collectively, we create some kind of a truth. And whether you believe in anything or not, I think we need something.